the Cayley graph of the free group on two generators. Okay, so um, maybe x is going to be the Cayley graph of free group, say a and b. And so every that's a, a three. And this three has, uh, it consists of what I think of as, as horizontal lines and vertical lines. So there are these cosets of, of the cyclic group generated by A and cosets of the cyclic group generated by B. Um, and uh, I, I, want to, I want to focus on one of them. So for example, I want to look at the horizontal lines. Okay, so the, the set uh, Y uh, is going to consist of the horizontal lines here. Horizontal lines in X. In other words, it's a set of set of uh, cosets of the group generated by A. Okay. And then if I if I have two of these yellow lines, then I can project one to the other, and I'm going going to get a point, which I'm going to denote by uh, pi so pi A of B. Okay, so this is the, going to be the uh, nearest point projection of B in Y onto A in Y. Okay, so for example, if I have, if I take, say, this line, this is the, the line B, and then this line is A, then, then this point here would be the projection. This is up A, B, right? Okay, so uh, what are some of the features here? Um, okay, so I'm going to list these, these. There are three properties that you should observe here. There is P0, which just says that if, if A is not equal to B, and these are in, in Y, I, I guess this is not quite correct mathematical notation, but you know what I mean. If both A and B are in Y, and uh, then, then this projection by um, a b, this is a point. Is a point in a. Okay. And then another thing you should observe is that if you take three lines, the a, b, and c. Uh, let's say, let's say these are my. So I have a, b, and then let's say this one is c. Um, well, maybe I should, I should, uh, you know, before stating P1, maybe I should make a, the following definition. So if I have three lines, so if A, B, and C are three lines in, in the set of lines, then I can talk about, you know, I can define uh, this object. So the distance measured in A between B and C. So if you, you know, if you're, if you live in the line A and you want to know about how far apart B and C are, you can just look at their projection and then you can measure the distance between the projections. Okay, so this is going to be the, you know, one way to say it is that it's the diameter of uh, pi A B union pi A C. So this seems like a silly way of, of saying this, you know, measure the distance between the projections. But uh, you'll see in a, min in a minute why I like this notation. Okay, so then uh, this, P1 property is that if uh, if the distance between uh, if this distance between B and C measured on A is positive, then in fact the distance in B uh, between between A and C is actually zero. See, if you have three lines A, B, and C, then you can form three of these distances. You can project. Uh, you know, you can pick any one of the three and can project the other two on that, and they can measure the distance. So you get three numbers. And what P1 is saying is that two of those numbers are zero. At least two. Maybe all three are. So you can see that in this picture, right? So if I project onto A, then B and C project to different points. And so the distance on A is positive. But that means that if I project A and C to B, right, I get the same projection. The distance is zero. And if I project onto C, both A and B project to the same point, so the distance is zero. So two of the three numbers are necessarily zero. Okay, 
And then the final property is that some kind of finiteness. And, and it's just that if, if you fix any two lines, say uh, A and B, so for A and B in Y, you can look at the set of C's in Y so that the distance in C between A and B is positive. Okay, so look at all. So A and B are fixed. You know, like say this one, this A and B. Then how many, oh, let's, let's think about B and C maybe. Maybe that's a better way to, okay. So think about B and C. You know, how many yellow lines are there so that the distance between B and C when projected to that yellow line is positive? Well, A is the only one, right? There are no other yellow lines that I can project B and C to to get a positive distance. And in general, this is finite. So the cardinality of this set is finite. Okay, so, so uh, th this is, th these are very nice properties, but now we want to kind of coarsify this. Okay, so I just, I, I want to be in some kind of axiomatic setting that, that, that occurs in nature. Okay. Um, so this is one of them, but uh, I, I want to I want to make uh, I want to make this coarse. In other words, I, I want to replace zero by some uh, maybe finite number. And so here here's a second example where this sort of thing happens. I can take a, I can take a discrete group of isometries of some hyperbolic space. Let's say of hyperbolic plane. Okay, so this discrete. And, and then I can take, a, uh, let, let's, say, let's say I have a, a hyperbolic element. I have a loxodromic element. So gamma is in gamma, and, and L is the axis of gamma. OK, so, uh, so here's the, the axis, L. And then I want to look at the translates of L by the, um, by the group. So those are going to be axes of conjugates of gamma. So that my set Y is going to be the set of, uh, I guess, gamma times L. This is the, this is the, uh, the set of lines uh, in the orbit, in the gamma orbit of L. Okay, so I have, so you could, you could think of taking, say, a surface. So imagine that, that the gamma is the fundamental group of the surface acting on the hyperbolic plane, like the deck transformations of, in the universal cover. And maybe you take, a, you take a closed geodesic in the surface, which is allowed to be immersed, doesn't have to be embedded. And you look at the lifts of all of the, of, of this curve in the hyperbolic plane, right? So you get some kind of a picture like this, right? So this, the script Y is the set of all these lines. All right, so. What are the, so we want to do a little surgery here on, the, on these properties, P0 through P2. I, want to, I still want this, this to be the nearest point projection, right? So pi by A of B, this is still going to be nearest point projection of B to A, when A and B are two of the lines there. Okay, so what, what do I get? So this, this, this is no longer a point, it's now um, some kind of a set. It's an interval, and uh, the, the important thing to, to realize is that this interval has uniformly bounded size. Okay, here is this interval. I could take, you know, take one, one of these, then you'll get an even smaller interval. Okay? So maybe, maybe I'll tell you in a minute why, uh, but let's, let's just start surgering the, the, these axioms here. So instead of saying that it's a point, I'll say that then the diameter, diameter of this set is less than some theta here. So theta is going to be some constant, which was zero in the original example, but here it's going to be some finite number. Okay, so why should that be true? I mean, why, why, should, why should the projection of one line to another always have a uniformly bounded size? Well, see, if... Uh, if not, you know, what's the, I mean, that, that's really, I, I should really leave that as an exercise, but basically, you know, how, how can two lines in the hyperbolic plane, two distinct lines in the hyperbolic plane, have large projection from one to the other? Well, the, the, what that should mean is that they, you know, that, that they, they're, par they're parallel for a long time. 
you know, th these lines have, you know, if you project this top line to the bottom line, you'll get some large interval. And that's really the only way. If you have, if you have two lines in the hyperbolic plane so that the projection of one to the other is a long interval, then that means that the lines are very close for a long time. Now, how can that, how can that happen? These are, these are axes of elements in the group that have a certain fixed translation distance, right? And this translation distance, distance is going to be small compared to, uh, compared to the length of you know, where, where they're close together, just because it's fixed, and, and we are assuming that, that the projection is, is large. Okay, so basically, you know, if you, if you call this element uh, you know, alpha, well, maybe it's equal to gamma, maybe, maybe it isn't, and this element is beta, say, then the idea is to look at the, the elements that are you know, commutators of you know, alpha to the n and beta to the n. You look at this element in gamma and argue that all these elements are small and they're going to be distinct in the group, and that's going to violate the discreteness if this happens, right? So if I take, if I take some point, I give myself a base point somewhere, say, and then I, uh, or maybe even, I, I, I can even make it simpler. Instead of the commutator, I can just look at the, say, alpha to the n, alpha to the n, beta to the minus n. Look at these elements, right? So what, what happens is that at this point, and I translate it uh, by, by alpha, you know, n, n units of whatever the translation distance is. And then I, and then I, uh, and I'm still close to the axis of beta. So I, I drop the perpendicular maybe to the axis of beta, and then I translate by beta in the opposite direction. Well, that's going to bring me very close to, to where I started. And if I, if I keep changing the ends, you know, I'll get these distinct elements, and they're all very short. And, and that, that there has to be a bound on, you know, just because we're in a discrete group. Okay, so that's why, um, that's why this will, you know, this P0 will hold. Okay, so what about P1? So here, here I have to, I cannot say zero. My threshold isn't zero, it's, it's this number theta. If, if I have a... Uh, you know, I, I make the definition in the same way. This is why I insisted on this kind of a notation. I can measure the distance between two lines, right? I have, I have this, my, my basic my line A, and then I have two other lines B and C, and I can measure the distance between B and C on A by projecting and then, and then taking the diameter of the, of the union of the two projections. Okay, so that's... Uh, uh, so so then, then what happens is that uh, if one of these distances is large, then the other two are less than or equal to theta, right? So you get three numbers, and at least two of them have to be bounded by theta. Okay, so this is this, this is this property uh, was motivated by by something that Jason Berstock did in uh, for mapping class groups, and in fact our our interest. So this is all. Uh, I mean, the, the, my my collaborators on this were um, Ken Bromberg and Koji Fujiwara. Is it, uh, Okay, so um, so this was this was somehow the main motivation for introducing this, this or looking at this axiom. We were interested at the time in in uh, mapping class groups, and we were trying to construct certain actions of yes. So these are supposed to be distinct lines. If yeah, I did, uh, there's a distinct. You, you don't project the line onto itself. That, that's, that's the, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. And then, and then the, the third one is also you have to, you have to put theta here. Um, so if the distance is large, if, the, if you specify, uh, you, you, you pick two lines and you, and you have this sufficiently large number, you're looking at all other lines so that the projection distance to the, to the third line is, is big, well, then that means that there's only finitely many such lines. Uh, I, I won't really try to say much about the proof of P1 and P2 in this context, but basically uh, the, the idea is that if, if uh, you know, if uh, let's say this is large, uh, then, then the picture is like this. So you have, here's B, here's C, you, you look at the common perpendicular. Here's the common perpendicular between the lines B and C you know, in this picture. And uh, what, what, what this means is that A has to, 
uh, stay close to this common perpendicular for a long time. And that's what, in, in hyperbolic geometry, that's what, that's what this means. That's what this translates to. Um, yeah, so, so this is A. You know, you're, you're, projecting, you're projecting B and C to A. And so this common perpendicular has to project to, to some uh, long segment joining the, joining the two projections. And so by the same principle as what we discussed in P0, that must mean that the common perpendicular stays close to this uh, axis A for a long time. Yes. There exists the theta, yes. Yes, yes, yes. No, no, theta equals zero wouldn't work here, but some, you know, I don't know what it is, log two or, well, no, no, it depends on the geodesic. It depends on, on, uh, on the geodesic effect. Okay, so anyway, you can, you can prove P1 and P2 by, by thinking about this, you know, that if, you know, if the distance here is large, then that means that A stays close to the, to the common perpendicular. So, for example, you can't have infinitely many of them, because if you had infinitely many of them, you know, they, they would start piling up. They would be close to each other for a long time. And we already ruled that out. Okay. Um, right. What else? Are there any questions? Confusions? Okay, so let me let me then state state the uh, theorem. So the, the idea is somehow, you know, maybe maybe you're starting with an action, and you, you give yourself uh, these lines and these projections. You know, suppose I'm thinking of this picture, and I'm I'm giving you this data here. I'm giving you a set of lines, and I'm giving you these numbers, the projections, project the, the projection distances, satisfying these things here. And can you can you somehow reconstruct? Can you can you build the space around it? Can you make the? Can you build the ambient space? Okay, that's a, that's the question, and uh, so the theorem. So that's the. Okay, so uh, let me. Let me just. Okay, so so y is going to be a collection. Of, well, I'll say geodesic metric spaces. That's not absolutely necessary, but. Basis, um, satisfying, and uh, so and uh, I A of B are um, inside A, or uh, for A B and A in Y are projections. Okay, so for any two uh, A and B distinct, I'm given. A subset of you know I can project B to A and it's a certain subset of A. Okay, that's what I'm given, and they satisfy so satisfying um, P zero through P two for some theta greater than equal to zero. Okay, so somebody hands you this. Okay, then, then in fact you can build the ambient space. Okay, there exists a metric space, geodesic metric space. Why? Um, and pairwise disjoint. Um, convex. Isometric embeddings A into Y for for all A and Y. So for every element of Y, you have a an isometric copy in big space Y. Um, so that for every A and B in Y distinct, the nearest point projection. of um, B to A is within bounded distance of 
of pi um, a to b. Okay, so so you don't quite you get, don't get the, the prescribed um, projections on the nodes, but after a bounded perturbation, you get you get those projections. Uniformly bounded. Uniformly. Uniformly bounded. And then there are various addenda here. Maybe I'll just list some of them. Um, okay, so the, the first one is that this whole thing is equivariant. So the, the, the construction depends on some choices. There is, in particular, there is a certain constant k. Uh, so the, the construction of y depends on some on the, on the choice of a constant k, which is supposed to be much bigger than theta, but it is equivariant. In other words, if you have a group acting, preserving all the data here, just like in, in our example, or both examples, uh, then, then the same group will act on, on the space y, and it'll, it'll permute these a's and do, you know, do the expected thing. Um, if, if every, uh, say, A in Y is delta hyperbolic, then, uh, then Y is hyperbolic. Okay, maybe not delta hyperbolic, but some, some other constant. If, uh, if every A in Y is a line, then, um, then Y is a, is a quasi-tree. So it's a space that's quasi-isometric to a tree. And there are various other things that I won't, I won't get into. Something we were interested at the time in asymptotic dimension, for example. So if you have a control on asymptotic dimension of these things, then this Y also has, yeah, its asymptotic dimension is controlled. Um, so, so somehow the, the moral here is that uh, you know a lot of groups have uh, non, many non-trivial actions on, on quasi trees. So you, you know that there are even hyperbolic groups that don't act non-trivially on any trees. This is true even for, say, uh, three manifold groups. There are hyperbolic manifolds that are not Hocken, and every the fundamental group when it acts on the tree will always fix a point. And then there's also, I mean, there are even worse examples in groups with property T, where not, not even a finite index subgroup will act on a, on a tree non-trivially. But, uh, but using this construction, for example, you can show that any hyperbolic group, any non-elementary hyperbolic group, acts on, on a quasi-tree in a non-elementary way. So the property T doesn't obstruct um, actions on quasi-trees. So here, I, I'm just thinking about sets here. You, you, you don't, we don't think of this as, as functions. You just record the projection itself. Okay? It's the image. It's the image of the nearest point projection map. The nearest point projection doesn't have to be uh, single valued, right? You could have more than one point that's nearest. So you just take that whole set and you, you assume that it, I mean, the axiom P0 says that it's uniformly bounded. So in these examples, of course, they were isometric, you know, these uh, elements of Y were isometrically embedded in the ambient space. But the axioms don't, don't say anything about the ambient space. There, there is no ambient space, right? You, you, you're just given a collection of these spaces and we're given these projections. We don't, we don't have an ambient space. In fact, so, so, in, in, so there, in, in these constructions, like in you know, this hyperbolic group, and you want to construct the actions on quasi-trees, then you do have an ambient space. You start with the Cayley graph of the group and that's a nice hyperbolic space. And you can use it just like in these examples. But, um, but there, are, in fact, our main motivation, maybe I'll, I'll list that as an example and, and I'll try to elaborate uh, if I have time uh, next time. But, uh, so, so here's an example where you don't, you're not given the ambient space ahead of time. 
Okay, so th this is in the context of mapping class groups, and there are similar examples in, in OutFN. Uh, but uh, I, I won't, so I'll just give you kind of maybe the simplest possible example. So you, 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 fix, you fix a surface um, of even genus. Okay, so um, maybe genus two is good. And uh, you look at um, you look at all possible uh, simple closed curves up to isotopy that uh, that separate this curve into two subsurfaces of the same genus, right? So it's kind of in half. Okay, so this is uh, this is one of them, but there are of course infinitely many. You can you can apply the whole mapping class group to this curve, and you'll get others. Okay, so you can uh, so this script y is going to be um, the set of isotopy classes of uh, simple closed curves in sigma that separate that separate uh, that separate sigma into uh, subsurfaces of the same genus. That's why I needed even to begin with. And the point of that assumption is that any two such curves will have to intersect each other. You cannot draw two disjoint curves like this. And then uh, there's a notion of a, a projection. So th this was due to Mazur and Minsky. So they have a, um, so if I, so, so to, first of all, to, to a curve uh, alpha like this, uh, actually, I, I, maybe I cheated here. Why should be the set of uh, set of uh, annulus complexes rather than um, the curves? I, I sort of think of that as the same thing. But anyway, if alpha if alpha is a is a curve like this, then I can associate to it the space. Uh, maybe we'll call it C sub alpha. This is the um, this is the uh, it, uh, What's the official name? Annulus complex? No, curve, curve complex of the annulus. <laughs> I don't know. Curve complex of the annulus around alpha. So I mean, I, I don't know. So this is the you know you can you can think of the taking a regular neighborhood of alpha and that's going to be some kind of an annulus, and and the annulus comes with a certain uh, complex. So this this is this is the kind of thing I, I, I can elaborate on next time. If, if I have time, I, I would like to go through the, some details of the construction. That's sort of the top priority. Um, so this is this is, whatever this is. It's it's quasi isometric to um, to a line, to R. Okay, and so this is really I should I, instead of saying set of isotopic classes, it's really the the associated uh, curve complexes, set of curve complexes of isotopic classes, simple closed curves. And then you have to check those axioms. And in fact, P1 is exactly uh, you know, this works of, work of Jason. That, and, and the other two are not too hard to see. So, um, so P, P0 through P2 hold. And I mean, the, the hard one, or the non-trivial one, is, is P1. So this is really due to their suck. And so you, you get, you, you, the output then of the theorem is that you have an action of the mapping class group on some quasi-tree, and, and it turns out that Dane twists will act uh, loxodromically in there. So, the, so these Dane twists, this, you know, Dane twist of this annulus is going to act uh, like a loxodromic element on this line, or on the quasi-line. And so you, you, everything is equivariant, and I'm going to get the space that contains all these lines, and these Dane twists are going to be shifting on their own line. Okay, so, uh, okay, so again, it's a quasi tree. So the, the output of this is that the mapping class group of sigma acts on a quasi tree. And, um, well, that's, I, th that would take a little while to define. I, I, I will do that next time if I have time. Um, okay, so. This is acting on the quasi tree, and the um, the Dane twists Dane twists in in uh, curves. And now here I go again, um, confusing the the curves with their complexes. But you know, curves in Y are 
um, loxodromic. So that's, I mean, if, if you think about mapping class groups, then that, that's maybe somewhat surprising uh, because, you know, the usual action, like on the, say the curve complex, uh, you know, the, the entwists are always elliptic. In fact, there's a theorem of Eisen that, that says that in a high enough genus, um, if you have an action of the mapping class group on a cat zero uh, space, then, um, then the translation lengths of the entwist must be zero. So they have to be either elliptic or, or parabolic. You cannot find an action on a cat zero space where they're loxodromic. So somehow there is no way to promote quasi trees to, to something cat zero, some kind of local negative curvature or non positive curvature. <clears throat> okay. No, 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 definitely not. Infinite balance. So, so I can, okay, I'm, I'm going to sketch the construction. And uh, the, 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 way, the way I'm going to sketch it doesn't quite work. And, and then we'll have to spend, you know, some time fixing that. That's, that's I mean, that's why the proof is not uh, immediate. Uh, no, no. I mean, here, say in this example. So in this example, the output is not going. It's going to be local infinite, quasi three. Yeah. So you you don't get you don't get the space you started with. If if you input this example, you're not going to get a hyperbolic plane back. You'll get a quasi three. Well, so in this quasi world, saying stabilizer doesn't really make sense. I mean, you can you can talk about you know subgroup seven bounded orbits or something, right? I mean, it, it's it's sort of core stabilizers. That's what they really want to think about. But but yes, you can you can have uh, you can have you can have a loxodromic element here. Maybe maybe this will make more sense when I uh, when I sketch what the construction is. But there are loxodromic elements here that will be elliptic in the in the projection complex. But not this one, right? This the, the one we started with. That that one will be. Um, Loxodromic, but there are many others that, that will end up. Some of them will be loxodromic, but some not. Some won't. So, so somehow, maybe one more comment about mapping class groups is, is that uh, you know we, we we like hyperbolic spaces, right? We have hyperbolic groups because we think we understand them, which is maybe not exactly true, but that's what we like to think. Ma mapping class groups are not hyperbolic, but what happens is kind of the next best thing, which is that given any element of infinite order, you can find an action of the mapping class group on some hyperbolic space so that this element is loxodromic. Or uh, that, that's also not quite true, but you, if, you, if you're allowed to pass to a finite index subgroup, then this is true. Okay, so in, so in some sense, we can understand any element in the mapping class group by uh, analyzing some action on a hyperbolic space. And that, that is still not known for out of n. That's maybe the main, I mean, the question about out of n, I think, if you, if you think about that stuff. Um, you know, if you can decide one way or the other, that would be a big um, sort of breakthrough. If you can, um, if you can either find an element that, that doesn't satisfy this, or you can prove that all elements of infinite order are loxodromic on some hyperbolic space. So we start with the disjoint union of of the, um, well, maybe another thing. <laughs> I keep, uh, keep thinking about. Uh, okay, so uh, another comment before we, we sketch the construction. Uh, that, so maybe motivation for the for the. This is how this came up, really. Motivation for the construction. So let's say we have uh, we have we fix two elements uh, of in our set Y. So we, we fix fix uh, A and B and Y. And now if I if I give myself a third element, then I can look at the projection to uh, to A, and then I can look at the projection to B, right? So I could try to plot where the projection is in the in the Cartesian product of A and B, right? So I want to look at the Cartesian product, so A A cross B. And now suppose we we plot, okay? So plot um, you know, pi, um, pi A of C cross pi B of C. So that's a subset, right, 
of A cross B. For, for C not equal to A or B. You know, for there are infinitely many of these Cs, for each of them, I can plot this uh, product. And that's some kind of a bounded set. Each of these is a bounded set in its own coordinate. So I can think of it maybe as a point. And so, okay, so this is A over here, or is B. So where can this be, right, in this product? Well, first, I, I, can give, so I can look at the projection of A to B and projection of B to A, and those can act as kind of base points in their own coordinates. So let's say, let's say this, is the, <laughs> this is the chosen base point. It's a thick base point, and this is maybe the pi, uh, pi A of B cross pi B of A, right? It's some kind of a bound that can act as a, as a base point. Now, if I take some random C, where can it land? The question for the audience. What does, what does P1 say? It disappeared. P1 disappeared. <laughs> okay. Um, remember, uh, so P1 said that, uh, yeah, I shouldn't have erased P1. So P1 said that, uh, um, so of the three numbers, so if we have D A B C, we have D B A C, and we have D C A B. So two of them, two are less than or equal to, th to theta. Okay, so how does that translate um, in, into this picture? What? Projection on the axis, exactly. So it has to be, it has, you know, you take some kind of a neighbor, theta neighborhood of the axis or something. It has to be in this yellow region. It can't be over here. That would, that would mean the two of the num three numbers are big. It has to be near one of these axes. Okay, so, so somehow what, what this suggests is that you should be looking at not the product. I mean, somehow the cheap way to, to build some kind of a space uh, that contains all these A's and B's and Whatever is just to take the product, but what, what this what, what this what this picture says, suggests is that we should be taking kind of a wedge. We should take the, the you know, maybe maybe a copy of A and copy of B and then connect them by an, by, an, by an edge or something, right? Some kind of a construction like that. So okay, so that's that's exactly what uh, what the sketch is. So you take so you start with the start with the disjoint union of the you know A's for A and Y. And then, uh, so this this is now okay, so in space, like that. So this is the A. Yeah, there's there's A, and then there's B, and there's C, and so on. And now I'm going to connect certain uh, pairs by by edges. So um, so if uh, so connect um, I A B with by B bay by edges. Here, I mean every point in here but with every point in here. You know, if I have to make it equivariant, so, or you can, you can make some, you can live in the world of graphs and then just connect the vertices from here with vertices from there. That's not so important. By edges, whenever, okay, so I have to tell you in what, in, in what situation I want you to connect uh, these. So I, I project B to A and I get some kind of a bounded set and I project A to B and I get a bounded set and then I want to connect uh, every point in one with every point in the other under certain conditions. I don't want to make a, I, want, I don't want to do this for every pair, just for certain pairs. And, and I'm going to do it when, uh, when, the, when, the, when they're close in the sense of these uh, projections. So whenever the set of C's such that uh, the distance in C between A and B is um, less than or equal to k is empty. So this k is this uh, famous parameter, fixed. So fixed k, much bigger than theta, and then make this construction. Okay. So if if I have if I have two of them, a and b, and and there is something there is something large in between. So like uh, so here is you know here is a. Here is B, and then here is C, and uh, you know in this, and then this, this, this is maybe large. This is larger than K. Then I don't connect A and B, right? because you know A, A is going to be connected to C, and C is going to be connected to B. 
So I don't have to connect A and B. Um, and, and then in, in order to make things equivariant, I, I'm just going to take the whole, you know, given the whole projection here, I'm just going to, going to connect every pair of points. And that's it. That's the construction. So you'll get some kind of a picture like this. And uh, that's the space. So this gives, this gives y. Okay, so this is morally the construction. It doesn't quite work. Okay, it, we have to do some uh, modification of the, of the projections first. But that's, that's what it is morally. Okay. Uh, how are we doing? Half an hour. Okay, so here, so then what happened, uh, what happened was uh, we, we were, all three of us were at MSRI, and so it was Alessandro Sisto, and we sort of got together and we found a, a simpler construction. Uh, it's kind of a simpler than, than the original one, and that's what I want to really uh, talk about for the rest of the time. Okay, so let me let then say in, in you know in two. There are kind of two steps here. The proof in two steps. Proof of the theorem or the construction in two steps. I don't know. Okay, so, so the first step is that uh, the, the sketch actually works under a stronger assumption. So sketch works um, under, under the stronger assumption. And so this is uh, SP1. This is the strong projection axiom 1. The other two stay the same. <clears throat> And it says the following, that if, if the distance, say, in A between B and C is greater than theta, then, um, then not only are the other two less than or equal to theta, but in fact, projections themselves are equal. Okay? So the, then projection of, um, of A to B is actually equal to the projection of uh, C to B. And then, of course, you can also permute B and C. So the other two, the other two are the same too. So pi. Uh, so hence, also, pi C of A is equal to pi C of B. Right by permuting B and C. Okay. So that's a that's a stronger. You don't you don't actually have that in in the example. In this example, this is actually not true. These projections, are, these projections are going to be close, but they're not going to be exactly equal on the nose. But the, the proof is, is simpler in that case. Okay, so if you, you know, this sketch will turn out to actually work. Um, and then uh, the second step is to, to, uh, to show that you can actually, give, given the original axioms, you can make a perturbation to achieve the stronger axioms. Okay, so there is a, so the second one is that given uh, p0 to p2, uh, there is a way to, to boundedly perturb the, the projections PAB to arrange the strong, to arrange SP1. Okay, so that's uh, that's what we do. No, no, you really need this. You'll see, I mean, there's, there's always, when you think about this stuff, there's always this kind of a threshold problem, right? You, you have some arbitrary k and you, you want this. And now, you, you, you know, you, this b gets replaced by some nearby guy that, you know, where the, and you, you could just be slightly over k at that point. And uh, if, with a stronger version, that doesn't happen. You know, these projections are just equal and everything is smooth, everything works. And then, and then you have to see how to perturb. Yeah, in the free group case, then the stronger version holds. Well, there, are, there is the case of these hyperbolically embedded subgroups. So I wasn't going to talk about, that, but that's the, you know, like what Dennis does. That then, then also these stronger axioms hold. So, so maybe, for the record, uh, I'll, I'll write the axioms again. So now, now, we, now we are going to work on this first step. Okay. 
And we won't be done uh, today with the first step, but we'll, we'll, we'll make some significant progress. Okay, so, uh, okay, so the, the axioms are, well, I don't know, I may as well call them SP1 and so on, although it's still all the same, right? So the, the diameter of, of um, I, y, I don't know why I have, uh, here, I, I have y and z instead of x and y, I don't know. Notation may not be consistent the whole time. SP0, yes. SP0, yes. And then SP1, this is uh, what we think of as strong bear stock. <laughs> the weak bear stock is over there. <laughs> um, okay, so, okay, so, uh, well, again, I can, maybe I'll remind you of the definition. So the, the, the distance in y between x and z is the diameter of, now I don't, I don't know why I have x, yeah, x, y, and z, and we had a, b, and c, I don't know. Sorry about that. That's just, it's, it's a different set of notes. <laughs> uh, pi x, y, union z, y. Okay, and then we have uh, sp1, um, that if the, so if, the distance in y between x and z is greater than beta, then, then the projection of y to x is the same as the projection of z to x. And obviously, by switching, the projection to z of both x and y is the same. And SP2 is that if, if dy, if, uh, if x and y are given in y, then the set of z's in y, so it's such that the distance in z between x and y is greater than theta, is finite. Okay, so those are our axioms. And then we want to space. I should also say, I, I'm not really going to prove uh, the, the, let's see. Yeah, given a space like this, you can, you can crush the, uh, you can crush each of these um, uh, spaces, A, B, C, and so on, to points. Okay? Uh, so, you're going to get some kind of a graph in that case, where you, you know, it's the, the vertices are these A, A's, B's, and C's, and then you join two of them by an edge if this holds. So we'll really prove that that's a quasi three. And then uh, the the arguments uh, for for this, this we call this the blown up projection complex. The arguments for the blown up projection complex are similar, and I, I probably won't get to that. But the the heart the heart of the matter is the, the this projection complex itself, where the vertices are elements of y and. Uh, Edges are given by the rule here. Okay, so that's really what we'll prove. Okay, so, um, so, okay, so we have these axioms, and uh, maybe uh, should I just state the theorem? Yeah, okay, so the, the theorem that we're going to prove, I'm, I'm just going to state it. Well, it doesn't. Uh, it, it, well, it, uh, no, no, it, it just, uh, the arguments are similar. I mean, uh, it, you just have to somehow. The, the, the arguments here are more basic, okay? And then you, you, you know, if, you, if you understand these arguments, then you can easily generalize that. Um, okay, so. <clears throat> Okay, so here, here's the theorem that uh, this is what we would like to show, is that if, um, so you, you define the whole, the following graph, so pk of, of y. Okay, so this is a graph, and the vertices are elements of y, and an edge 
um, you know, it goes from A to B, you put an edge if, if the set of C's such that the, the projection distance to C between A and B greater than K is empty. Okay. That's the that projection complex with this parameter K. Then VK of Y is a quasi tree. So, so, for instance, what does this mean in the in the in the original example? Uh, you know, how, the the dependence on k, for example. How, how does that work? So, so back to example one. So this is the this is the example with yellow lines. Right? So they can they're going to become orange. Okay. Um, Okay, so I'm, I'm, in this, I'm in the setting of the strong axioms with theta equal to zero, right? Theta is equal to zero here, and, and the strong axioms hold. So when, uh, when are two edges, two, two lines connected by an edge? How does that depend on k? Well, um, you see, I have a, I, I, I take a, so they're orange, supposed to be orange. I take a and b, and I'm wondering whether they should be, as the vertices in my graph, whether they should be connected by an edge or not. So what do I do? Well, I look at the, I look at the connecting, you know, there is a, there is a, a path in the tree that connects them. And then if I see, if I see a segment that's, uh, you know, a to the k, right, I see k a's in a row. So, the, the, you know, I can, I can read off, you know, th this is subdivided into little edges and each edge is a or b. With some orientation, if I see a to the k or a to the minus k somewhere, then I don't connect them by an edge, right? Because then, then I will have a, an orange line that passes through here, and then the projection distance is going to be k. Actually, it should be k plus one because I use strict inequality. If k is an integer, uh, then then you know, so th this should, I should say plus minus k plus one. Well, I didn't say that k is an integer, but anyway, you can you can figure it out. <laughs> if if I see more a's in a row here, then k, then, uh, then a and b are not connected, right? So a and b, a and b are not connected here. Not connected by an edge. In, uh, in p, k, y. And, if, and otherwise they're connected by an edge. So somehow as you keep increasing k, there are more and more edges. And so the, the two the spaces are not going to be quasi isometric to each other. You're you're sort of contracting the distances as you go along. When when you see more A's than K in a row, because if if you see this picture here, then that means that there is an orange line that passes through here, right? Orange line is is the that's the line of A's. And so if I, if, I hit, if I see k plus 1 a's here, then there's an orange line, c, and then the projection distance on c between a and b is bigger than k. So then I don't draw an edge between them. And otherwise I do. And so you can, you can see that for any a and b, you know, if you make k large enough, then a and b will be connected by an edge. Okay, so we, we're going to define the following thing. So this is yk of uh, xz. X and Z are elements of, of Y, and K is our constant. And uh, I want to look at the set of Y's so that uh, the projection distance is greater than K. Right. Okay, so there is a set. This set is finite by, uh, by our axiom. And 
this uh, this step step one of this um, proof of this first part is going to be that uh, that this has a natural linear order. So y k x z has a natural linear order. So you can see that in this example, right? In the example, you just look at these strings of of a's that are long enough, and there are, of course, pairwise disjoint, right? So you have the I have a string over here, and I have another string, and I have another string, and each one of these strings comes with its yellow line, orange line. And these lines are exactly uh, the set. And you can see that there is a natural order, everything from left to right or whatever. I mean, I, it, it, uh, the, you know, this x and z come in a particular order. There's x on the left and z is on the right. If I switch x and z, this order will also flip. So if I, uh, if I look at these orange segments, they naturally go from one of these lines to the other in some natural linear order. Okay, so that's what we want to now establish from the axioms. <clears throat> okay. Okay, I, I, I'm, so here's a lemma, and I'm normally not a fan of, of lemmas like this. There, there are you know, six equivalent statements, <laughs> but, but this is actually useful in applications. Um, so these are six equivalent statements, and, and if they hold, then we'll say that one of these is less than the other. Okay, so fix is a lemma. Okay, so fix, say, y0 and y1 in, in the set, yk of xc. And k is at least, uh, I think k, k is at least 2 theta here. So then the following are equivalent. And I'll go over here. Is this still readable over here? If I go, how far can I go? Here? Is that okay? Here is okay? Anybody? Okay. Is it okay? So there, there are six. But this is the picture you should you should keep in mind, right? So the, the maybe I'll draw it again. Uh, yeah, with, with orange, but now we'll have y0 and y1. So, we, so there's going to be there's going to be x and there's going to be a z, and then um, there will be y0 and there will be y1, like that. So this is the picture to keep in mind, and and there are six character six ways of of saying this picture. <laughs> okay, so it's a it's one. The distance in y0 between x and y1 is greater than theta. Right? So the distance, if I project to y0, uh, then, then you know, x and y1 are far apart. Right? This, this, this length here is like k, or bigger than k. It's certainly bigger than theta. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, there, there are five more coming. Uh, two is that if I project y0 to y1, this is the same as projecting x to y1. Okay? So that's somehow saying that y1 is not between x and y0. Right? Okay, so, okay, so three, um, the distance in y1 between x and y0 is less than or equal to theta. Distance in y1 between y0 and z is greater than theta. Okay. So that's again saying that y1 is between y0 and z. And then projection to y0, y1 is the same as the projection to y0 and z. Okay. So that, that's saying that y0 is not between y, y1 and z, they're sort of on the same side, so they have the same projection. Okay, so there is a certain symmetry here. I mean, you, you can you can flip you can flip x and z and also y zero and y one, and these statements are symmetric with respect to that flip. Okay, so the, the proof the proof is uh, 
It's fairly simple, actually. And I'm going to write the, okay, so there is one, three, there's a chart of how you prove this. Four, six, uh, there's two and five. And then the arrows go this way. And each of these arrows, I claim, is just the you know, application of an axiom. Um, I probably should have pointed out that uh, projection distance satisfies a triangle inequality. That's, uh, uh, it, uh, we, we're, only, we're assuming we are assuming that y0 and y1 are in this set uh, of, you know, where the projection distance is large. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, so one observation is that the, the, this distance dc, the, the, the function d sub c, satisfies the triangle inequality. It's just it's the diameter of the projection. So it satisfies the triangle inequality. And, uh, okay, so... Uh, okay, so the one one implies three, so that's just uh, uh, bare stock, right? That's uh, that in fact that's the that's the weak bare stock, right? There, there's no so if if one distance is bigger than theta, then the other two are less than or equal to theta. Here I'm just permuting uh, y one and y zero. You know, so this this distance is large, so that means the other two are small. So that's that's why one implies three. And then there's also symmetry. You know, this flip this flip of x and z and y zero and y one. That that's that's you know that takes one to four and three to six. So this is also the the, the same the same argument for this one. Four implies six. This distance is large, therefore this one is small. Uh, three implies four is is just the uh, triangle inequality. Because what uh, what we know is that the distance in y one between x and z is bigger than k, and k is at least 2 theta. So these two numbers, by the triangle inequality, they have to add up to at least 2 theta, or more, to more than 2 theta. And if this one is small, then this one must be large. Right? That's just the triangle inequality. And, and similarly, this one, by symmetry. Right? And... Uh, One implies two. Well, that's exactly our axiom. One implies two is SP1, right? If this distance is big, then these projections are actually equal on the nose. So one implies two is SP1. And, and similarly, this one, SP1. And the last one is just a definition. Right? How do you define the distance? Well, you project and then you look at the diameter of the, of the union. Well, if these two projections are the same, then I can replace y0 by x, right? Because they're, that's, I get the same number. But once I put x, then this distance is in fact bigger than k. It's certainly bigger than theta. Right? Does that make sense? So 2 tells me that I can replace y0 by x here. But then I know that the distance is bigger than k. Because y0 and y1 are in the set of these elements where x and z have a big projection. Okay, so this is the definition plus the assumption that we are in this set. So both of these are. So this flipping symmetry is, amounts to 180 degree rotation of this diagram. And so now you can see that everybody implies everybody else. Uh, so, so Berstock is a is a consequence of the. It's the weak version of the of SP1. The SP1 says that uh, you know if if this holds, then then the the projections of y0 and x to y1 are equal to each other. So when I take the diameter of the union, I just get that same set, and its and its diameter is less than or equal to theta by by an axiom by SP0. Yeah. Okay. That that's exactly a five minute proof. So we have to prove that this, uh, that, uh, that this defines a, a total order. Okay, so we're going to define the order. Okay, so define y0 less than y1 if 
if one through six hold. So this is in this this order. This is in y sub k of uh, x v, right? Take two elements and I, I make I, I define y zero is less than y one if any one of those six hold. And now what I have to check is that it's a total order. But notice that uh, so a total order. In other words, the, any two elements are comparable. Okay, so notice that y zero is less than y one if and only if y one is not less than y zero. This is by uh, by the equivalence of one and three. By one equivalent to three. Are these the right numbers? I think so. Right. So the one and three. If you if you if you replace if you replace y zero and y, if you switch y zero and y one, then one and three are saying exactly the opposite. So that's, that's, that translates into saying that y0 is less than y1, if and only if y1 is not less than y0. So that means that it's a total order. But now I still have to prove transitivity, right? So how do you prove transitivity? That's slightly more involved, but not, not uh, all that much. OK, so transitivity. So I want to show that if uh, if y zero is less than y one and y one is less than y two, then y zero is less than y two. Okay. So the picture you're supposed to keep in mind is something like this. Here is x. There is y zero. There is y one. There is y two. I'm thinking of them as some, some kinds of lines, right? They're arranged, and, and this is the dream. This is what I'm aiming for, right? They're, they're supposed to come in this order. Now, what do I actually know? I'm going to draw these projections as points, but they don't, of course, have to be points. But so what do we know? We know that if you, if you project x and z to y0, then they're going to be far apart. Projections are far apart. That's the assumption that y0 is in this set of things with large projection. And I, don't, I know this for, for y1 and y2 as well. Right? This is sort of the picture. But just because they belong to this set. What else do we know? Well, we know that, uh, that y0 is less than y1. And so what that means is that uh, if I project y1 to y0, I'll get the same projection as z. That's one of these six statements. Right? Both y1 and z are on the same side, so to speak, of y0. So when I project y1 and z, I'll get uh, so z and also y1. I'm going to think of it as the same point, but it's clearly a set, thick point. Okay, so that's the picture. Uh, what else do we know? Well, now I can, I can do the same thing in, in y1. I know that in y1, if I project y0, I'll get, the same, I'll get to the same place as x. Right? That's also one of the equivalent statements. And, uh, and likewise, since I know that y1 is less than y2, I know that this is, you know, y2 is over here. Right? So what do we know about the distance between y0 and y2 on y1? We know it's big, right? But that's the same as the distance between x and z. I don't know, I'm not writing all these... Uh, I'm just, I'm just putting down symbols. That's what you're supposed to do, right? That's, you know, instead of writing various, uh, the projections are equal and so on, you're just, you're just writing dots, you know, to, to indicate where the projections are. And this is what we know so far. So we know that, for example, in Y1, when we project X and Y0, we get to the same place, and Z and Y2, we get to the same place. But those places are far apart from each other. <clears throat> okay. So now I can use uh, my axiom that says that if, if some projection distance is large, then the other two are, you know, if I project to y0, uh, then the projections of y1 and y2 are going to be the same. Right? That's our axiom. 
the axiom says that uh, so from this picture here i see that i see that the projection to y0 of y1 is the same as the projection to y0 of y2 that was the that was sp1 just by looking at this picture just because because y0 and y2 are far apart on y1 then that means that these projections are equal so that means that i can i can stick y2 here right i can put y2 over here, because y2 and y1 have the same projection to y0. But now that, that means that uh, y, so th this, this, this implies that uh, y0 is less than y2, because, uh, because it has the same projection as z. That's also one of the six equivalent statements. Right? So y2 is kind of on the same side as z from y0. So that means that y0 is less than y2. I don't know, maybe that was a little quick, but this is, this is what you're supposed to do in this business, right? You, 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 you draw these pictures and you draw projections and you apply the axiom and then you're done. <laughs> so should we go through this again? Uh, I don't know if... Uh, okay, so, so I, started, I started with this picture of X's and Z's, right? X's and Z's. I, I, I can do this because, because uh, all, all my Y's are in this set where the projections of X and Z are large. And then I'm also putting in the, the dots or the projection that indicate that y0 is less than y1 and also that y1 is less than y2. That's how I know that I draw y0 at the same place as x and y2 at the same place as z. But that implies that the projections of y0 and y2 to y1 are large. The, the distance between them is large. And so by, by using this axiom, I know that in y0 and likewise in y2, the other two have the same projection. So that tells me that y2 and y1 project to the same place. But then, but then, I, but then that, that tells me that y is less than y2. Because y2 projects to the same place as z. That was the definition of the order. Or one of the six equivalent definitions. So the, 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 picture, the picture of the order is just that... Uh, um, oh, I'm, I'm done, huh? Okay. <laughs> Maybe just one last picture, and then and then we'll go. No way. All right. So the, the picture of the order is just so here is x, here is z, and then you have a bunch of these things in between. If you project to any one of them, right? You you pick one of them, and then you project x and z, you get some uh, projections that are far apart. But anybody to the left in this order is going to project to the same place as x, and anybody to the right is going to project to the same place as z. So you just see this picture. There are only kind of two projections you see in each of them. No, not X and Z, but all, all, all the others. That's the picture. You know, anybody that's on the left of this guy is going to project to the same place. And anybody that's to the right of this guy is going to project to the same place. And, there, and these two places are far apart. That's the picture. Yes. No, you're right. We haven't yet. Uh, this will come up next time. So this will give us this will give us a path from uh, from x to z. It turns out. Well, we have to prove another lemma first. And so if this set is infinite, we wouldn't have a path. So the space probably wouldn't be connected. <laughs>